nationalism is a habit of assuming that human beings can be classified like insects and that whole blocks of millions or tens of millions of people can be confidently labelled good or bad. But much more importantly, it's the habit of identifying oneself with a single nation or other unit and placing it beyond good and evil and recognising no other duty than advancing its interests. Nationalism is inseparable from the desire for power. The abiding purpose of every nationalist is to secure more power and more prestige, not for himself, but for the nation or other unit in which he has chosen to sink his own individuality. A nationalist is one who thinks solely or mainly in terms of competitive prestige. His thoughts always turn on victories, defeats, triumphs and humiliations. He sees history, especially contemporary history, as the endless rise and decline of great power units and every event that happens seems to him a demonstration that his own side is on the upgrade and some hated rival is on the downgrade. The nationalist does not go on the principle of simply ganging up with the strongest side. On the contrary, having picked his side, he persuades himself that it is the strongest and he is able to stick to his belief even when the facts are overwhelmingly against him. Nationalism is power hunger tempered by self-deception. Every nationalist is capable of the most flagrant dishonesty, but he is also, since he is conscious of serving something bigger than himself, unshakably certain of being in the right. It would be an oversimplification to say that all forms of nationalism are the same, even in their mental atmosphere, but there are certain rules that hold good in all cases. The following are principal characteristics of nationalist thought. No nationalist ever thinks, talks or writes about anything except the superiority of his own power unit. It is difficult, if not impossible, for any nationalist to conceal his allegiance. The smallest slur upon his own unit or any implied praise of a rival fills him with uneasiness, which he can only relieve by making some sharp retort. He will show great sensitivity about such things as the correct display of flags, relative size of headlines and the order in which different countries are named. He will generally claim superiority for it, not only in military power and political virtue, but in art, literature, sport, the structure of the language, the physical beauty of its inhabitants and perhaps even in climate, scenery and cooking. The intensity with which they are held does not prevent nationalist loyalties from being transferable. To begin with, they can be and often are fastened upon some foreign country. A country or other unit which has been worshipped for years may suddenly become detestable and some other object of affiliation may take its place with almost no interval. All nationalists have the power of not seeing resemblances between similar sets of facts. A British Tory will defend self-determination and oppose it in the same breath with no feeling of inconsistency. Actions are held to be good or bad, not on their own merits, but according to who does them. And there is almost no kind of outrage, forced labour, mass deportations, imprisonment without trial, forgery, assassination, the bombing of civilians, which does not change its moral character when it is committed by our side. The nationalist not only does not disapprove of atrocities committed by his own side, but he has a remarkable capacity for not even hearing about them. Much of the propagandist writing of our time amounts to plain forgery. Material facts are suppressed, dates altered, quotations removed from their context and doctored so as to change their meaning. Events which it is felt ought not to have happened are unmentioned and ultimately denied. Indifference to objective truth is encouraged by the sealing off of one part of the world from another, which makes it harder and harder to discover what is actually happening. There can often be genuine doubt about the most enormous events. The calamities that are constantly being reported, massacres, famines, revolutions, tend to inspire in the average person a feeling of unreality. One has no way of independently verifying the facts, one is not even fully certain that they might have happened, and one is always presented with totally different interpretations from different sources. Probably the truth is discoverable, but the facts will be so dishonestly set forth in almost any newspaper that the ordinary reader can be forgiven for swallowing lies or for failing to even form an opinion. The general uncertainty as to what is really happening makes it easier to cling to lunatic beliefs. Since nothing is ever proven or disproven, the most unmistakable fact can be impudently denied. All nationalist controversy is at the debating society level. It is always entirely inconclusive, since each contestant invariably believes himself to have won the victory. Some nationalists are not far from schizophrenia, living quite happily amid dreams of power and conquest which have no connection with the physical world. 
If one harbours in one's mind a nationalistic loyalty or hatred, certain facts, although in a sense known to be true, are inadmissible. Here are just a few examples. Types of nationalist, each for whom I append a fact which it is impossible for that type of nationalist to accept, even in his secret thoughts. The reason for the rise and spread of nationalism is too big a question to be raised here. The point is that as soon as fear, hatred, jealousy and power worship are involved, the sense of reality becomes unhinged, and as I have pointed out already, the sense of right and wrong becomes unhinged also. There is no crime, absolutely none, that cannot be condoned when our side commits it. Even if one does not deny that the crime has happened, even if one knows that it is exactly the same crime that one has condemned in some other case, even if one admits in an intellectual sense that it is unjustified, still cannot feel that it is wrong. Loyalty is involved and so pity ceases to function. It can be plausibly argued, for instance, it is even possibly true, that patriotism is inoculation against nationalism, that monarchy is a guard against dictatorship, and that organised religion is a guard against superstition. Or again, it can be argued that no unbiased outlook is possible, that all creeds and causes involve the same lies, follies and barbarities. As for the nationalist loves and hatreds of which I have spoken, they are part of the makeup of most of us, whether we like it or not. Whether it is possible to get rid of them, I do not know, but I do believe it is possible to struggle against them, and that this is essentially a moral effort. It is a question, first of all, of discovering what one really is, of what one's own feelings really are, and then of making allowances for the inevitable bias. If you hate and fear Russia, if you are jealous of the wealth and power of America, if you have a sentiment of inferiority towards the British ruling class, you cannot get rid of those feelings simply by taking thought. But you can at least recognise that you have them and prevent them from contaminating your mental processes. The emotional urges which are inescapable, and perhaps even necessary to political action, should be able to exist side by side with an acceptance of reality.